Welcome. Uh, I should say my name is Dr. Peter Hawes. I said on the previous slide, I'm an outreach officer in the SAGE faculty, that's the science faculty, science and engineering here at the university. My background though is a chemistry teacher. I used to teach for 20 years at Pontinland High School in Northumberland. And I came to the university 10 years ago on a Royal Society of Chemistry fellowship for a year, and the university kept me on. I've been here um, 10 years now. Uh, so, yes, this year, 2019, as I said, is has been designated as the International Year of the Periodic Table because it's the 150th anniversary of the most widely used sort of uh, form of the table that we're used to that was devised by the Russian chemist uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. And so there's the web that's the website for the International Year of the Periodic Table. There's lots of videos and quizzes and information and stuff about elements on there. And they also have a, as everybody does these days, they also have a, a, a Twitter, Twitter tag. Okay, so this lecture is called Colourful Chemistry, sorry, the elements of colour. Because obviously, handily, because everything's made up from elements, the whole universe is made up from elements, I can talk about any aspect of chemistry, and it includes elements by definition. So we will use a little bit of stuff from elements today. Most of the reactions are actually going to be compounds, but it's going to involve colour. Colour's pretty important. If you didn't see things in colour, the world would be pretty dull. And of course, one of the earliest aspects of colour you come across is uh, a rainbow in the sky. That's, of course, produced by uh, white light uh, refracting through raindrops and splitting up into these seven colours. But obviously when you're younger, you call them a rainbow. When you get to, to secondary school in perhaps year eight or year nine, you'll do this experiment where you pass white light through a triangular block of glass called a prism. Some students think I say prism. Prism, P-R-I-S-M. And it splits the light up, because it's sort of a bit like raindrop shaped, isn't it? So raindrops do the same thing with sunlight. So it splits them up into the seven colours of, uh, what well, used to call a rainbow, um, when you get to do exams in school, you call it a spectrum, because that's the correct scientific name for it. So uh, we'll refer to that as a spectrum from now on. I might regress and say rainbow, but uh, those seven colours are, are pretty important. So just to show you, that I think I showed the same slide last week, um, that visible light, which is what we're going to talk about today, allows us to see and allows us to see colour, is a small part of this much larger and more important, equally important thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you look at those names in the grey uh, boxes, grey lozenges, I'm sure you recognise most, if not all, of those names. They're all important types of radiation that we use or make use of every day. Radio is obvious, microwaves for cooking and for <coughs> mobile phones, infrared for heating, visible lights we can see, ultraviolet light also useful for sort of heating things and so on. Can cause problems if you get too much of it on your skin. X-rays, of course, medical use. And uh, so there isn't much of a use for... Uh, uh, for gamma rays, they're far too high energy. They just tend to smash things up. Um, but there we go. We're going to concentrate on visible light, which is a part of this much bigger uh, spectrum. So, mixing colours. So, the first time you, you come across colour mixing is with dyes or paints or uh, crayons or pigments, colours from, from dyes. Probably even before you go to school, you'll be experimenting with different coloured water paint or crayons or whatever, and you'll rapidly find out if you mix more than one colour together, you can produce others. And you eventually find out that the three what we call primary colours that we can make all the other colours from in paint or dyes are red, blue and yellow. If we mix any two of those together, we can make these three secondary colours, purple, orange and green. If we mix all three together in the right proportions, we get black, light, uh, black ink or black uh, dye. Then, of course, we, uh, you get to secondary school, and you'll come across colour mixing of light if you haven't done so already. And, of course, you'll immediately notice on this right-hand diagram the three primary colours are different. Well, one of them's different. Uh, it's red, blue, and green, not red, blue, and yellow. But I still used to get students in GCSE exams telling me that the primary colours for light were red, blue, and yellow because they were so ingrained in that idea from primary school and from art and so on. So you meet this much later. But red, blue, and green are our primary colours for light. Mix any two of those together, we get our secondary colours, yellow, magenta, and cyan. Uh, and all three, of course, produce white light. No such thing as black light. Black is, in fact, the absence of light. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, and that colour wheel is what we're going to use from now on. So, why do we see a surface as blue? So, here's my nice blue tray. I'm going to be using it in a few minutes' time. Um, can anyone tell me? Hands up, don't shout out. Why is that tray blue in terms of the light falling on it? Should the lady hand went straight up? Because it absorbs every other colour. And what does it do with the blue? It makes reflection. Brilliant. Absolutely correct. You didn't all hear that? All the colours of light are falling on it. There we are. Thank you very much. Um, I'm surprised. All the other colours of light are falling on it, she said. They're absorbed, taken into the material. 
blue light is reflected back to your eye, and so that's why it appears blue. So a similar principle, red top on this bottle is only reflecting red light to you, it's absorbing the other colours. Uh, and so on a white surface, so the wall or the screen here, is reflecting all seven colours of light back at you because you've got white light lighting up the room. They're all being reflected back to your eyes, so it's white. And anything that's black, my coat isn't black, it's sort of very dark blue, but something like my laser pointer or this box here where the microphones recharge, or if you're wearing a black school uniform, anything that's black, my mouse... Or the computer screen, now the monitor, yeah. That is black because it's sending no light to your eyes. So you can't see it. That sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But there's no light coming from this computer monitor to your eye. All the colours are taken in. None are reflected. That's why a surface is black. It's sending no light to you. But you know it's there because the things around it are sending light to you. So that's how you can see a black object. But black reflects no light. There is no such thing as black light. You'll hear about... You know, buying black lights or go to a disco where they have black light. It's not black light, it's ultraviolet light. Your eyes don't detect ultraviolet light, they only detect visible light. Uh, and what they call black light is actually UV light and it allows certain things to glow or fluoresce under certain uh, conditions. But it's not really black light. Black isn't, say, is the absence of light, the absence of any colour. So that's a blue surface because it's reflecting blue light. Okay. What about solutions? We've got some coloured solutions on the front here. We're going to be looking at them over the course of the lecture. Let's look at these green solutions here. So would anyone like to suggest why are they green? This is blue because it's reflecting blue light. Would someone else like to suggest why that solution is green? Is it because it takes in yellow and blue, which makes No, reflect is not, the, uh, is not the correct answer, but you're along the right lines. So have a prize for answering. Oh, sorry. Um, there we go. It doesn't reflect it. It's a slightly trick question because a, a lot of people would say, that reflects blue light because it's a solid object. That should reflect green light as well. It's not reflecting green light. Yes? That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for having a go, though. That's great. It's not reflecting light, and the reason it can't is because the particles are too small. Uh, the previous slide showed you the wavelength of light. It was measured in a unit called nanometer, and nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9. So 0 0.8 naught to the 1. Very, very small. Um, so this is larger than the wavelength of light, so light can bounce off it. The particles that make up this solution, so the water particles and whatever else is in there, we'll come to what's in there later, they are much, much smaller than the wavelengths of light. They're not nanometers. They're only picometers or even smaller units apart. That's 10 to the minus 12. So they can't reflect it. What's actually happening here is all the light passing through, it all gets absorbed apart from green. Green passes straight through and comes out the other side. That's called transmitting. It's transmitting light. Uh, so it can't uh, reflect light. The particles are too small. But we will see a demonstration at the end of the lecture where I'll do a demonstration where you will see a solution reflecting light because it will make particles that are big enough to do that. The particles will be bigger than the wavelengths of light, bigger than nanometers. So they'll be nanoparticles. Uh, these are much smaller. They're transmitting the light. It's sort of the same principle, but not exactly the same phenomenon. So as I said, sight needs light. If you go into a darkened room, switch, or in a cave, switch all the lights off, you know, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. You need some level of light to see anything. And of course, you have rods and cones at the back of your eye. Uh, I always get this the wrong way around. Rods detect black and white and cones detect colour. Cones need a higher, higher level of light to function. So that's why at low light levels, like at night, or in a very dark room, you don't see colours very well. You tend to see more in black and white, because there isn't enough light coming into your eye for your cones to work. Obviously, in a higher light intensity like we've got now, you can hopefully see colour uh, perfectly normally. So, yes, you recognise these slides from last week. If you were here last week, what's our ultimate light source on the Earth, of course? It's the sun. Not at the moment. It's obviously gone down because it's night. Uh, but, of course, it's not burning ball of hydrogen. It's nuclear fusion. Two atoms of hydrogen fusing together to produce an atom of helium and generating a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. So where else, of course, can we get light on the Earth? We can get lightning. Electrical potential discharge. So even though this is elements of chemistry, we've got the odd bit of physics is going to creep in. I apologise for that in advance. Um, so electrical potential discharge, a bit, uh, bit of physics. Fire, combustion. So we are going to do some combustion again this week, but hopefully we're not going to set the fire alarm off. Uh, 
And remember, chemistry, scientists, we like to give uh, big, long names to things, so we look impressive in front of the general public. So we can't just call it fire, we have to call it combustion. Or even better, deflagration. It's an old-fashioned word for it. I remember using deflagrating spoons when I was at school. I would have used some last week if we'd lasted long enough. <laughs> there we go. And finally, I'm not going to talk about these again uh, today, but obviously there are some uh, living organisms that produce light in their bodies called bioluminescence, because it's from living things. And they produce light, but they don't produce any heat, which is quite unusual. But it is just a chemical reaction. Not going to talk about that today, but that is part of um, you know, a light source on Earth. So, um, I'm actually going to do uh, this three sections. We're going to talk about some chemical reactions in a moment that involve uh, changes in colour. We are going to burn, or I'm going to burn some stuff um, that's going to produce some coloured light. And we're also going to do... Um, look at, finish off by looking at what we call some rates and kinetics experiments where we change the speed of a reaction and uh, hopefully something interesting uh, occurs in terms of colours. So we're going to start off with reactions and we're going to start off with a colourful reaction. Now, if I take the, well all of you, particularly the, the, the children, it won't be so long ago, take you back to when you're in primary school and usually when you come back after the summer holiday, uh, you know, first day back is, what did you do for your summer holiday? And quite often... Uh, you know, your teacher will ask you to draw or write or paint about what you did for your summer holiday. Now, of course, a lot of us like to go on holiday to the coast, to the seaside. That's very easy for us here, of course, because we're located quite near to the coast, but we don't have to go to our coast. We can go to some other bits of coast uh, in other parts of the country or even the world. Uh, clearly, obviously, there's nice parts of the County Durham coast and the Northumberland coast and the Cumbrian coast as well. Um, but, uh, you know, so if your teacher asks you to draw or paint about uh, the seaside, what colour would you paint the sea? Blue. Yeah, because we all know water's blue, isn't it? Here's my bottle of water. Yeah, it's blue, isn't it? Yeah. Not. <laughs> okay. So, I do have another container here with some uh, water in. Uh, can I volunteer? Can we shake it? I'm going to get out quite easily. Thank you. It is glass, so try not to bust it. <laughs> Do that, put it down here, turn around so you're facing the audience so everybody can see, just hold it nice and securely, give it a good shake. So water isn't blue, is it? Oh look, it is. <laughs> well done, have a book. Thank you. <coughs> Don't work you very hard here, you just have to shake a, shake, a flask, shake a flask and get a book. There we are. So what's happening here, clearly of course it's not just water, because water's never going to turn blue in a billion years. I could shake that bottle as long as I like, it's not going blue. Um, now, as I probably said last week, I, I have a real aversion to anyone connecting the M-word with chemistry. This is not magic. It's completely explainable and reproducible chemistry. I know exactly what's going on in all these experiments. I can repeat them hundreds of times a year, and I do. I know exactly what's going on. So magic, sadly, is only found in Harry Potter books and films and lots of other things about, about magic. This isn't magic. It's chemistry. It's completely explainable. We know what's going on. Sorry to deflate a few people there, but I have a real bit bone in my... A beer my bonnet about people call it. I'm doing chemistry magic shows. It's not magic. So this wasn't just a bottle of water. There was some other stuff in there, which happened to be colourless. You couldn't see it. So what was in there? Some glucose as well, dissolved in the water. That's just sugar. And there was this chemical here, quite a complicated looking molecule, called methylene blue. Uh, some of the students, or even adults, anyone may recognise the name methylene blue. It's often used, most commonly used in school in biology as a stain for staining cells to then look at them more clearly under the microscope. So it's a, it's a dye. It's an organic dye. But it has two forms. It has the blue form, when it's what we call oxidised. And if you add electrons to it, that's called reduction. You add two electrons to it, you get this colourless form. And that's what the glucose did. So I set this up, these bottles up in advance before you came in. It was colourless because it did go in blue, and the glucose turned it to the, the, from blue to the colourless form which is what it's existing in uh, then. When you shake it up, it reacts with the reactive gas in the air that's inside the bottle. What's the reactive gas in the air? Oxygen. Oxygen. And it oxidises, because that's the opposite of reduction, oxidises back to the blue form. And that's what it's existing in now. As it sits there, it will take a minute or two. The glucose is now working away at it, giving it back electrons, and it's going to turn it back into the colourless form again. And if we wait long enough, it'll take two or three minutes, so we're not just going to st stand there and stare at it. We'll move on to the next uh, demonstration. Uh, but keep half an eye on that bottle. You will notice over the next few minutes, the colour will um, become colourless again. Remember that for the student's point of view for exams, don't say it goes clear. 
Clear just means you can see through it. Clear is a simple word for transparent. There's only one word for no colour, colourless. That's me wearing my examiner's hat. I'm an, I'm an examiner for A-level chemistry. I have been for 26 years. So these solutions are not uh, clear. Well, they are clear. They're clear green. But they're, or you can get clear blue, clear yellow. Clear just means you can see through it. It's another word for transparent. It's not a word for no colour. Only word for no colour is colourless. As I've said at the bottom, though, other colour changes are available. So this second bottle is called the traffic light bottle because it's going to go the three different colours of traffic lights in, uh, in a moment. Now, I haven't realised uh, until recently that this is really a demonstration I could only do in the United Kingdom. Fortunately, I don't do any international outreach at the moment, so that's fine. Um, actually, I'm going to Northern Ireland, so that's sort of international uh, next month. And I did go to Scotland before Christmas, so it's sort of international. Uh, <coughs> but most of the countries in the world, you couldn't do this demo because they've only got red and green traffic lights. They don't have amber. We're one of the few countries in the world on roads that have an amber traffic light. So we could do this one. It's not going to do it in the right order. So I'm not going to ask you what colour traffic lights are. You all know the red, amber and green. So have we got a volunteer to come and have a go at the traffic light bottle? Yeah. Turn over there on the end. Yeah. So we've got to be a bit more subtle with this one because it's going to go two different colours. And hopefully it's going to work because this one's a bit more temperamental. So make sure you're facing everyone. So First thing to do is gently shake it. Just very gently shake it from side to side. And it goes red. Great. Now shake it vigorously. And it goes green. Brilliant. Have a book. <laughs> Thank you very much. So there we are. There's the three colours of the traffic light and it worked. Yay. <coughs> the dye in there, it's basically the same chemistry as in the blue bottle. Oh, look, the blue bottle's fading now. It hasn't gone completely colourless, but it's getting there. Um, this has a different dye in. Uh, it's just called it, it, the reaction's exactly the same. I don't know the structure of it. It's a bit more complicated. But it's called indigo carmine. You may recognise the name indigo. Indigo is the dye used to dye uh, denim jeans. So it's quite a common. They extract it from a plant. Carmine's just, indigo carmine is just a variety, a variation of it where you uh, add, add some bits to the molecule. Uh, you sulfonate it, basically, and that makes it more soluble in water because indigo is not very water-soluble. So this has three forms. It's got an oxidised form when you shake it up, which is green. And then the glucose will reduce it back to the intermediate form, which is red, and then eventually back to the reduced form, which is yellow. And again, we can repeat that cycle. You can repeat it four or five times. So when I go into schools, I sometimes do this demo lecture three or four times across a day. And the blue bottle and the traffic light bottle will last all day. But eventually it will stop. It's starting to go. There we are. It's gone back, gone back red. Leave it long enough, it will then go back to yellow. But it is, is repeatable. You can shake it up again. Eventually, though, one of the chemicals gets used up, and then it just stays the same colour. It doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't change. It usually ends up with reduced colour. So it'll end up yellow or colourless. Okay. So the next set of demonstrations is to look at uh, these green solutions. Now, they contain something called a nickel complex. We won't worry too much about what nickel complexes are, because to explain in detail what they are, uh, that's sort of year 13 A-level chemistry. So I'm not going to explain them in detail, but hopefully you can see in the diagram, we have a nickel ion, nickel Ni, uh, and it's an ion because it's charged, it's lost some electrons. So it's a nickel ion, and you all recognise that water is H2O, it's got six water molecules stuck to it. That's why it's a complex ion, because it's a bit complicated. It's a bit complex. It's a simple ion with six waters stuck to it. And that makes it green. We're not going to explain why it's green. I said that's year 13 chemistry. But it is green. And you can see that. We've got the same solution, all four beakers. What I'm going to do in this demonstration is I'm going to start taking the waters off and replacing them with a different molecule. And when I do that, it will change colour. Now, I could ask you to predict what colour the first one's going to go. But I'm sure you, most of you probably don't know any nickel chemistry. I've forgotten the nickel chemistry I might have known when I was at school a long time ago. Hasn't been even on A-level syllabuses for a, for a number of years. So I could ask you to predict the first one, but you could probably tell me any colour uh, you, know, you like under the spectrum or the rainbow. So what I'm going to do in a moment, I'm going to do the first one to give you a clue, and then I'm going to ask you to then help me to predict the other two. Because one of the things about, as you guys will know from studying science, is that the more data you have, the better it is to spot a pattern. And a lot of stuff in all three sciences is about spotting patterns in how things behave. Now, when you've only got one piece of evidence, you can't really spot a pattern, can you? The more bits of evidence you've got, the more bits of data, the better you spot the pattern. While I remember, I said that, you know, you're not familiar with nickel complexes, but uh, there's certainly very important complexes in nature and in our bodies that uh, are really important. Um, what's the red substance in our blood that carries oxygen around? Hemoglobin. Well done, sir. 
That is a complex. It's not as simple as this one, it's more complicated, but it's got an iron ion in the middle of it, and that's why it's red. It's the same colour as rust, as rust has got the same iron ion in it, so they're a similar colour. So your blood and rust have got exactly the same iron containing uh, ion in them, P3+, so that's why that's important for carrying oxygen around. What's the green pigment in plants that uh, allows them to photosynthesise? Well, they're in the chloroplast. It's in the chloroplast, and what's it called? Chlorophyll. Yeah. And chlorophyll is also a complex. I haven't got a structure of it. In fact, had we got further on with the lecture last week, you would have seen the structures of hemoglobin and uh, chlorophyll, because I was going to do some experiments with iron and with magnesium, because they're trace elements that our body needs. Um, anyway, there we go. Hey ho. So, say, complex ions are very important in nature and also in other you know, chemical systems as well. This is quite a simple one. So let's show you what happens when we replace two of the waters with another molecule. I have to stir it because you'll see mixed colours when I initially do it. And sorry, I forgot to put some white tiles under here. Uh, I forgot there's a brown table. But hopefully you can see it's changed blue. It's blue now. Because what we've done is taken two waters off and replaced it with this other molecule called diamine. Proper name is ethylene diamine. That's not important at this stage. Again, you'd study all the chemistry of this and why it happens at, uh, at A level. Um, but, and at university level as well, of course. But you can see it's turned blue. Well, now you've got a bit more data. You've got green, blue. Anyone would like to predict what colour the next one's going to be when we put another diamine on? At the back? Indigo or purple. Thank you. That's a prediction. A prediction is something you think's going to happen. An idea based on what you already know, based on previous what we call evidence. Anyone want to predict any other colours? Yellow. Yellow, thank you. Oh. Anything else? Red. red, thank you. A lot of people say red because you're thinking of the three primary colours, green, blue, red. So that's a sensible prediction based on prior knowledge. Yellow, also a reasonable prediction. So is indigo or purple. Based on prior knowledge, that's a, what you already know about colours and about patterns of colours. They're all reasonable predictions. Of course, you can predict anything you like. You only know if you're right by actually carrying out the experiment. So I used to get to one of these old uh, coursework assignments at GCSE a few years ago called SC1s. Students had to make a prediction about something and then actually test it out. And I also get students used to come to me and say, is my prediction right, sir? I said, I don't know. Go and do the experiment. Uh, you say you can predict anything you like. Uh, you only tell if it's right. Uh, by, by trying it out. So let's now put a second one in. If I give that a nice stir up. So well done uh, at the back because you're absolutely right, that's indigo. Might look purple, you'll see why it isn't purple in a moment. That is indigo. Uh, and we've replaced two more waters by diamine. Well now you've got some even more evidence. So usually, um, you know, reception kids in primary school get this last one right. Usually, I usually have to hold a, a rainbow up to give them a bit of a clue. Sorry, a spectrum. Um, so green, blue, indigo. What colour's the last one going? Purple or violet. Why? What's the pattern? Yeah, you tell us because you got it right. It's the last four colours of the spectrum, isn't it? Or the rainbows we used to call it. So well done, you called it the spectrum. Yeah, green, blue, indigo, violet are the last four colours of the spectrum or the rainbow. Remember, Richard of York gave battle in vain. Roy Gabiv is a mnemonic to remember those colours in the right order. And by GCSE, you'll have to. So, let's now put that in. And you're absolutely right. There we are. It's purple, violet, whatever you want to call it. Mauve. Uh, we'll call it violet. Replaced all of them. And this is great, just for say, for A-level chemistry, it's a really nice reaction. It's the only reaction I know where you can replace these waters. They're called ligands. Anything stuck onto a metal uh, ion in a complex is called a ligand. And this is the only reaction I know where you replace the ligands one at a time and you get a different colour every time. It's quite a nice little demonstration. Annoyingly, we can't go the other way. It'd be great to also have, carry on the other way and have a yellow, orange and red beakers and have all seven. Can't do it with this reaction because we've replaced all the waters. And in fact, certain complexes, red, red, red ones don't occur very often. They're not very common. So annoyingly, I can't do all seven. I could do it with universal indicator, but that's not the same thing. That's, that's acid-based. So no, thank you for helping with some predictions there. There's a nice bit of, chem bit of colour chemistry using transition metals. The nickel is a transition metal. I'll show you a periodic table a little bit later. And the transition metals, one of their key properties, you'll learn about them by GCSE, 
is that they often form coloured compounds, like these. Okay, and the final thing I'm going to show you in this section is a catalyst actually working. So what you will say, um, what's a catalyst to start with? Does anyone tell me, before I put the definition up, anyone want to be brave and tell me what their definition of a catalyst is? What a catalyst is? Yes? And, always worth two marks in the exam, by the way, if they ask you what a catalyst is, because there's two things you have to tell me. It does speed up a chemical reaction, and or but, we're going to finish that sentence. That's okay, well, it does speed up a chemical reaction, that's true, that's good enough, uh, that's half answer the question, so I've got the other card here for whoever can give me the second half of that uh, answer. Speeds up a chemical reaction, but or and. No? Well, it will, it, you can get some that do slow them down as well, but to be fair, we should say change the speed of a chemical reaction, because it can sometimes make them go slower. We usually want them to go faster. What's the other thing that's really important about a catalyst? Yes, sir. It makes it go to a solid state. Uh, might do, it doesn't do it with all of them. Yes? It doesn't get used up. doesn't get used up, thank you very much. We covered and changed at the end. Absolutely. There you go. Brilliant. Yeah, so, speeds up a chemical reaction, but doesn't get used up itself, or recovered and changed at the end. There's various ways you can say it. There we are. Species in chemistry doesn't mean is it a cat or a dog or whatever. A species means type of particle. Any type of particle. Atoms, molecules, ions, whatever. Species which speeds up a reaction, but you are right, you can sometimes get catalysts that slow reactions down. Usually you want to make them go faster, but it doesn't get used up itself. Recovered unchanged at the end. Not, as some non-chemistry uh, sort of science teachers tell you, a catalyst speeds up a reaction but doesn't take part in it. How can it speed the reaction up if it doesn't take part? Of course it's going to take part. You're going to see it taking part, but you get it back at the end. That's the important bit. So let's do the reaction. So don't worry that you can't see what's in the bottom of this flask, because what's going to happen is going to come out the top, so you're all going to see it. I normally have a wooden block that I stick it on, but I suddenly remember this afternoon, I took it over at Christmas to paint it, because I haven't used it for a long time, and forgot to bring it back. Um, and because I'm not in my building, I work in a different building in the university, I wasn't suddenly going to run, up, run back over there and get something to stand it on. But it doesn't matter, you'll see the reaction coming out the top. Okay? So that's a solid in there called potassium sodium tartrate. That's not particularly important. It wants to react and produce a gas. It wants to make uh, carbon dioxide gas, in fact. Now, I'm going to add a bit of warm water just to dissolve it, because things don't dissolve, don't react very well uh, solid, because the particles can't move. So I'm going to dissolve it up in a bit of warm water from my kettle. Normally, I just use warm water from the tap if I'm in a, in a lab. OK, well, to react, it's got to react with something. Things don't, few chemicals react by themselves. Most have to react with something else. So what are we going to react it with? Um, we're going to react it with this stuff. Oh, look, this is a proper chemical. Because it's got, look, it's in a bottle with lots of nasty hazard symbols on. Of course, as I said last time, I'm going to say again today, you guys, of course, I'm preaching to the converted here. You know, of course, that everything in the universe is made of chemicals. So I'm sure you, like me, get really annoyed when you see these adverts saying, we've got chemical-free shampoo. To which I always say to my wife, who isn't a scientist, that, oh, they're selling you a bottle of vacuum then, are they? It's not going to get your hair very clean, is it? Or, you know, chemical-free whatever. Everything's made of chemicals, but it's amazing how many people don't get this. So I'll tell you, we want, you know, chemical-free farming or chemical-free whatever. Everything's made of chemicals. Um, but people think that chemicals are just things in nasty bottles like this that kill you. Well, some chemicals are nasty and do kill you, but some are quite useful. If you don't drink that for a couple of days, you'll be pretty unwell. You can go without water, you go out, sorry, go without food for a few weeks, but if you don't drink water after a couple of days, you're going to get, thank you, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get pretty ill. This stuff, as I say, is a proper chemical. It's called hydrogen peroxide. Uh, H2O2. So it's very similar to water. Water's H2O, of course. This is H2O2. It's got an extra oxygen, but that makes it significantly different. Don't mind drinking water. You saw me drinking some earlier. Wouldn't like to drink this stuff. It cause me very, very bad burns. The corrosive symbol there. Hydrogen peroxide is more commonly just called peroxide. There's hundreds of peroxides, but that's, more com that's the most common one. So it is just called peroxide, and it does have an everyday use. What's peroxide used for in every day? Could be used as bleach, yeah. I'm thinking of even more specific use. I don't need to use it. Yeah. Hair dye, yeah. Hair, bleaching hair blonde, peroxide blonde. So 
You wouldn't like to use this stuff though, because this is about 100 times stronger than what your hairdresser would use. So if I put that on my hair, it would bleach it blonde, but it would also snap it off at the roots, and it would probably take the skin off my scalp as well. So I'm not going to try that. I'm quite happy with my hair, the colour it is. In fact, at my age, I'm just quite happy my hair hasn't gone grey yet. So uh, there we go. So um, there's some peroxide solution. It wants to react with this, and they both want to make gases. This wants to make carbon dioxide gas. Peroxide will decompose and make oxygen gas. So we're going to get two gases produced from this reaction. Again, for the students, question that will come up, could well come up in a GCSE exam or even before then, but certainly at GCSE, comes at an A-level occasion as well. Um, this reaction is going to produce a gas. What would you observe? It's amazing how many students don't know what the word observe means. Observation is using your eyes. It's something you can see. So it goes bang is not an observation because you hear that, you don't see it. Um, gets hot or gets cold, or hopefully you say exothermic or endothermic. That's not an observation. You don't see that. You feel it. Well, you put a thermometer in and measure it, but you don't see something getting hotter or colder unless it gets so hot it's glowing red, then it's at about 700 degrees and you want to worry a bit. Okay, how can you tell this is giving off a gas? What would you observe? What would you write in an exam if they ask you this in an exam? Yes, you lady there? It would, oh, brilliant, well done. That's the, that, that certainly deserves a book. Uh, because normally people tell me the F word. Fizz. Fizz, yes, thank you. I don't know what you're thinking of. Well, what else you're thinking of. Absolutely. Yeah, fizz. I get year 13 A level students that write it fizzes. I give them the mark, but I, I cringe about it when I do it because they should know F of S. So well, young, well done, young lady, absolutely right. F of S. But of course, it's quite a long, complicated word. A lot of students can't be bothered to spell it, or they're too lazy to spell it, or they can't spell it, so they write fizz. You could also say bubble. But F of S, well done, is the correct word. So I'm going to mix these two chemicals together, and let's watch for that huge amount of fizzing taking place. Can you see any? Any fizzing? Any F of S-ing? Sorry, I've got me doing it now. I'm going to be talking about rainbows in a minute. Yeah. Any fizzing? Uh, F of S-ing? No, that's because this reaction's very, very slow. We need the catalyst. And so the catalyst is this stuff. It's also a transition metal compound. That's why it's brightly coloured. It's called cobalt chloride. It's a nice pink solid. Now, when I used to do this demonstration, I used to have the, liquid, the solution already made up. And you used to hear people sort of um, whispering in the audience, oh, I bet he's got acid in there. Because for some reason, students think anything works with acid. Any reaction that works must have acid in it. Um, so just to prove this isn't a solution in acid, I'm going to make it up in water. Here's my bottle of water. You've already seen me drink from it. Ah, that's the best hydrochloric acid I've tasted all day. Um, well, there's an acid I could drink, of course. What's the acid you can drink and put? Well, you wouldn't probably like to drink it, but what acid do you put in your chips? Yeah, vinegar, acetic acid, ethanoic acid, sorry, I should give it the proper name. Yeah, so that's an acid that you, you put on your chips, or some people like to put on the chips, I know some people don't like vinegar. That's why I prefer salad cream to mayonnaise, because salad cream is made with vinegar. Mayonnaise isn't. I much prefer the taste of salad cream, so I'm old-fashioned. Okay, so here's our catalyst. You can see it's pink. I'll get hold of it against the screen. It's a nice pink solution. So it's going to speed up the reaction, and it's going to be recovered and changed at the end. So if it goes in pink, what colour is it going to come out at the end? Pink. But it won't be pink in the middle, because it will take part in the reaction. It will speed the reaction up. It will change colour. But it will revert back to being pink at the end. Hopefully. Usually works. So I'm now going to add that in. And I'm not going to hold it in my hand like I did a moment ago. I'm going to retreat a safe distance away. <laughs> you will see why in a moment. Now, it might look like nothing's happening. Remember, chemical reaction, everything, everyone expects everything to happen instantly these days. But this, uh, things have a reaction time, have a, you have to overcome the activation energy, that can take a few seconds. So um, don't worry, when it gets going, you'll all see it, even though I haven't put it on my little wooden block, apologies for that. Well, I can see it starting to uh, FMS a bit more. It's getting a bit more rapid, it'll get more rapid than that. You'll all see it, don't worry, you won't miss it unless you blink for a bit. What colour's it gone now? Yeah, it's still not finished. That's a bit faster, isn't it? I love this. I used to show this to all my GCSE students and A-level students. It's the only reaction I know where you can see a catalyst actually working. That was a bit more uh, effervescent. Effervescent, yes, good work. Effervescent. Giving off lots of gas. It's also giving off uh, some heat. This is exothermic, but that's not an observation. 
Remember, it was green in the middle because it was taking part in the reaction. But look at the end. It's gone back pink. Uh, and that's one of the crucial things about catalyst. Speeds up the reaction, but recover them changed at the end. I put one gram of catalyst in from this bottle. If I collected up all this liquid or the solution, evaporated all the water off, I would have one gram of catalyst back there. None of it has been used up. Catalysts are never, ever uh, used up. You, of course, have catalysts in your... Uh, in our, we all have, and me as well, I think, I think I'm human. Um, we, have, we have catalysts in our bodies. They're called enzymes. They're biological catalysts. They perform all sorts of useful functions. <coughs> functions? What's happening there? Sorry. All sorts of useful functions. Uh, so there's en even enzymes in your saliva. Your digestive process starts in your mouth. So when you chew stuff, the enzymes in your saliva start to break down the food before you even swallow it. There are enzymes in your stomach and in your gut to help the digestive process. There's enzymes in your blood to get rid of chemicals that, if they're in the blood, would do you harm. They get rid of them in seconds. Peroxide for a kickoff. You don't want peroxide in your blood. That's bad news. So there's a, a chemical in your blood called peroxidase. It's an enzyme, and it destroys any peroxides in your blood uh, instantly. Um, very, 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 very efficient. In fact, enzymes are far better catalysts than any catalyst a chemist could make. They're thousands of times faster. We still don't understand why, but they're much, much more efficient enzymes than a chemical catalyst, and they're huge, big molecules. Uh, and I say there's a whole, whole range of them do all sorts of different, uh, uh, different jobs. That's why you notice you get enzymes out of washing powder, don't you? It's washing detergents and washing powder contain enzymes because they're very good at digesting and breaking up uh, grease and other, other uh, uh, things that obviously making your clothes dirty. So, that's a catalyst. There's the chemistry, it's a bit complicated, don't worry about that too much. Other than the catalyst, it was cobalt, it went from pink to green because it gave an electron up, it got, uh, got oxidised, it gave the electron to the reaction to set the reaction off. But at the end of the uh, reaction, the reaction gives the electron back to the cobalt and it goes back to uh, pink cobalt too. And I say it's completely unchanged. That's the only demo I know where you can actually see a catalyst working. You can't see a catalyst working in your stomach, I don't think you'd want to go and have a look, I don't think I would. Uh, you can also have catalytic converters if you drove here or came on a bus or any sort of vehicle. They will have a, if they're powered by an internal combustion engine, they'll have a catalytic converter uh, in the exhaust system to turn nasty gases coming out of the engine into less nasty gases coming out into the environment. Okay, so there is the periodic table. Again, showed you this last week. Uh, just to show you, we're talking about the transition metals. That's this yellow block in the middle. So there's cobalt, the one we just talked about. There was nickel that was in the green beakers, but it's now four different colours. We talked about iron and haemoglobin, and there's obviously lots of other important transition metals um, in there as well. And the ones that are in catalytic converters are things like ruthenium, rhodium, platinum, sorry, palladium, platinum, uh, there. You know, it's gold and, sil gold and silver are transition metals, they're there. So one of the important properties of transition metals, a lot of the compounds are brightly coloured, they aren't all, a lot of them are brightly coloured, and a lot of them are very good chemical catalysts. Certainly by the time you, the students get to GCSE, you'll meet several of these are the metals or compounds on them that are used in major industrial processes. Enough said. Now we're going to set fire to some stuff. This is where it gets a bit hairy. No, I say, if the smoke alarms go off in here, they must be the most sensitive ones ever. I did both these demos yesterday at our chemistry schools quiz in our, in our lecture theatre in the Benson building, which is where I'm based. Didn't have the fire alarms turned off. Didn't go off. So there we are. So... You've seen, these, uh, you've seen some of these last week, but I, uh, there's a slightly different variation. I'm not doing calcium today, because we're not talking about uh, uh, metals that are important for humans. So these are some different metal salts. I'm squirting on um, a fuel called methanol, and then I'm going to set fire to it. I'll switch the lights off as well, and we'll get some nice coloured flames, which are distinctive for each metal. Students, at the time you get to GCSE, you need to know these colours and know which metals they represent, because they can be used as a test for those metals. Trump should never go very well, let's do a bit more metal. All right, so I'll put that down out of the way. And we'll set fire to them, it takes a few seconds to get going, so while we're waiting for it to get going, I'll switch the lights off. One of them hasn't got an emergency lighting, so it does go fully dark. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so going from, well, my left, it's your right. This first one, this nice, I'll put colour to describe it as, that's lithium. The second one, the nice bright yellow, orange, that's sodium. You recognise that from street lights. Um, that's sodium. This third one, it's always a bit pathetic, I need to do something about it. That's lilac, pale lilac, that's uh, potassium. So those first three elements in group one, lithium, sodium, potassium. 
This horse one, the red one, which is not a bit big, didn't get going. Um, that strontium, it's the only element named after anywhere in Scotland. Strontium Mountain, so strontium. And this lovely green one, every time I do this, people say, oh, look, it looks like the Goblet of Fire in Harry Potter. That's probably how they did the Goblet of Fire. That's probably CGI, to be honest. But this is copper. And notice it's green, but you can see some blue tinges in it. So as this one boils, uh, boils down, burns down, the copper one will get bluer and bluer. I'm sure that's not a proper adjective. Um, because it, the, as the heat of the flame gets cooler, that becomes more, from more green to being more blue. So how does it work? Here's a little animation. And of course, the principal use of this is colouring fireworks. If you want to colour fireworks, different colour. So fireworks can need people who are chemists to know what to make in the firework mixture, and then what to add to make them different colours, or to make them sparkle, or bright, or whatever. Um, so basically, here's the heat source, here's an atom, there's a nucleus, and there's a, we're just showing one electron orbiting around here. There'll be more than one, of course. Here's the heat energy coming in. It's given to that electron, it goes to a higher level, but then it loses that energy rapidly, drops back down, and it gives that energy out not as heat, but as visible light. So in this example, it's saying it's giving it out as orange. So that's a bit like the, uh, the sodium. And because, of course, in every element, the gaps between these electron levels are different, they give out different frequencies, different wavelengths of light. And you've got five different colours there. There are others uh, available. There are five of the classics. You certainly need to know those five for GCSE and probably a couple of others as well, like calcium and barium uh, and so on. Their colours aren't quite as um, aren't quite as strong. So that's why I say this is used to colour fireworks. And so the copper one being green and blue. So green fireworks and blue fireworks are both coloured by copper. You just uh, change the burn temperature of the, the uh, gunpowder. If it burns really, really hot, you get green. If it burns a little bit cooler, still pretty hot, but a bit cooler, you'll get a blue flame. And uh, that's uh, an important use of that. So, this is used by uh, scientists, not just chemists, in something called spectroscopy. That uh, We've already said if you pass white light through a prism, you get the whole spectrum. <laughs> Rainbows, we used to call it. If you heat up a gas and pass it through a prism, you don't get a whole spectrum. You only get certain lines, certain colours. And that is a fingerprint. That's characteristic of each element. Each element, particularly metals, give you a different pattern of lines here. And so this is used for a chemical technique called atomic absorption spectroscopy. You can use it to identify metals, often in solutions, down to tiny quantities, parts per billion. So it's used by people like the water, the water boards and so on, when they're looking for, you know, is there any pollutants, pollutants in water samples and so on. Um, you can also do the same thing, astronomers use the same thing to work out which um, elements are in stars from a very, very long distance away. Because obviously you can't go and visit a star, they're thousands of light years away, it will take, you know, many, many, many sort of human generations to get there. So we can look at the light coming from a star, though, pass it through a prism, get this pattern of lines, and then we can work out from the patterns of lines which element or elements are uh, making up that particular star. Um, and in fact, that's how helium was first discovered. Helium uh, isn't actually occurring very much on Earth. It was first discovered by an astronomer looking at, and I looked up his name the other week and I've forgotten it. Um, he was looking at the light from the sun and he noticed some lines that weren't just hydrogen. And so they discovered helium. So it's wrongly named. It's an eum, but it's not a metal. All the other, all the other eums are metals. But they thought helium was a metal. It's not, it should be called helium, shouldn't it? Because it goes with argon, krypton, neon, and so on, the noble gases. But once they discovered the rest of the noble gases, much later, they weren't going to change the name. The name is in too much common use. So helium is an odd element because it's wrongly named. It's named like it should be a, uh, named like it should be a, 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 a metal, and it isn't. Okay. So I did this one last week as well. This is a whoosh pot with a twist, and this is colourful chemistry. Sorry, the elements of colour. Well, we've done this lecture about 200 times called colourful chemistry. It's a bit difficult to change. Remember, I've changed the name, but the content is exactly the same. So it's exactly the same whoosh pot as I did last week, except I've added something extra to it, so we're going to get a nice colourful flame, hopefully. So just to remind you, we've got a fuel in here, this is ethanol, and I'm going to give it a good shake-up, because when we burn fuels, we don't burn the liquid, we burn the vapour. So I'm giving it a really big shake-up. So I get some nice ethanol vapour. It's nice and warm in here, even though it's January. Uh, a lot of fuel is in, the heating's obviously on. I've set fire to a few things, so it's got a bit warmer. Touch wood, nothing untoward has happened yet. If it didn't happen with them, it's not going to happen with this. I can, I can promise that. Famous last words. The last two demos don't involve setting fire to anything, so we should be uh, touch wood, and that's plastic, if I use my head. Um, 
There we are. So big shake here, making sure I'm vaporising the fuel into vapour, because it's the vapour that burns, not the liquid. Oh yeah, plenty of it there. Tip the excess liquid out, because I don't want the liquid, that's not going to burn very well. So it's the, the vapour that burns. There we go. As much of that as possible. And the ethanol's not going to escape. Ethanol vapour is less dense than air. It's trying to go that way. Sorry, that was a bit rude, that. Sorry, it's trying to go that way. Um, so uh, it's not going to escape. Right, OK. OK, then. Have we got a volunteer to come set fire to my hopefully colourful wash bottle? Uh, let's pick someone near the end of a, a row. Gentleman there, yeah? <coughs> Okie dokie. So, if you hold this stick by both hands at the end, so you've got a good uh, brace on it, so you notice I've got my nice uh, candle on. This is an altar candle, by the way, so you can have to get it to the right size. Birthday candles are too small, and normal candles are too big, so it's, uh, this is an altar candle. So, I've split that. What I'm going to do in a moment is take the lid off there and run away. And you're going to hold the candle flame just over the, uh, the neck of the bottle. Okay, we should get a nice colourful flame. You ready? Off you go. Yay! Marvellous, thank you very much. Have a good. <laughs> there we go, so, push bottle with a twist, nice green flame. Not copper, actually, you might have think I put copper in, if you remember back from the previous uh, demonstration. Uh, but it's not, I actually put boric acid in. Boric acid, strangely, is not a metal, but it does give a green flame test, so it's, and it's cheaper than... Uh, well, basically, I've got a big bottle full of it, I've got to use it up before I retire. So there we are. So that's the reaction, ethanol burning in oxygen to give carbon dioxide and water, and in general, of course, any fuel reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. We won't see the carbon dioxide out of this, because, of course, that's a gas, it's just vaporised out. But the other product is water, so hopefully you can see if I hold the bottle up, where my finger is at the bottom there, if I just gently want a bit from side to side, can you see some liquid sloshing around? Yeah. That's some of the water that's been produced in the reaction. Not all of it, because some of it, of course, would have vaporised out. That, was a, that flame was probably at about five or 600 degrees, so it's certainly going to have evaporated some of the water. Now, engage brain, students, before you answer this question, because this is a classic. Uh, I ask this a lot. I uh, asked it yesterday and got the right answer, actually, at the school's quiz. I would hope for it was the, it was the, the, uh, the national, national chemistry school's quiz. I would hope that somebody there would get it right. Um, I always ask, so this, you know, you might get this in an exam question. Students carried out this experiment. Um, they think that the colourless liquid is water. How could they test to prove it's water? Engage brain before you answer, because the first answer most people give me is a ridiculous one. At the back there. And how would you tell it's water by boiling it? Bo boils at 100 degrees. Thank you. Yeah, well done. You gave me the right answer. Brilliant. Sorry, I've run out of books. Um, <laughs> well done. That is the correct answer. Boils at 100. The two silly answers that students put in exams is drink it. <laughs> Clearly, that's a ridiculous answer. You don't drink anything from labs. But look at the other colourless liquids I've shown you that aren't water. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Put some oh, lights back on. That's it. We get a bit more light. Peroxide, colourless liquid. Certainly don't want to drink that. Meth ethanol, colourless liquid. Well, you might want to drink that at low concentration because that's obviously it's drinking alcohol. Ethanol. That's neat stuff. You get liver cirrhosis and die rather rapidly if you drink that. And methanol also is a colourless liquid. So you don't drink liquids to test them. That's very very bad. The other one students tell me is test its pH and it'll be seven. Or put indicator in, it goes green. Well, that's true for water, but then methanol and ethanol would also go green with indicator. Peroxide wouldn't. It's acidic. But those two would go green. So that's not a test, but a lot of students put that in the exam. And you're absolutely right. Well done. Uh, boils at 100 degrees at atmospheric pressure. I have to say that. Because if you boil water on top of Everest, it only boils at about 40 degrees. You can't make a decent cup of tea on it. it used to be a whole physics lesson, that. Why you can't make a decent cup of tea on top of Mount Everest? Um, but there we go. I digress. So that's the wash bottle. So fuel and oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. That's combustion. That's burning. And just to remind you that the process that's keeping you alive now as you're sitting here, as I'm standing here, respiration, breathing. Uh, remember I said in you know, science about to give things long, long names. You don't call it breathing. You don't call it respiration. It's the same thing. No, it's just the same reaction. The fuel is not ethanol, of course. It's glucose. It's sugar from our food. It's reactive with oxygen in the muscles. 
carried there by hemoglobin that we talked about earlier. And of course, we get a lot of energy produced, but not as a flame. You wouldn't want flames in your muscles, that might be a bit painful. It produces just heat energy, movement energy, and so on. If you like me a bit older, uh, sound energy, because you creak a bit. Um, and we also get carbon, same waste products, carbon dioxide and water. So respiration is exactly the same piece of chemistry as burning, combustion. It's just happening in your body, and it's producing a different type of energy. But the, the chemistry is exactly the same. And now we're on to the final uh, section. Keep a pretty good time here. Um, final couple of demonstrations which don't involve setting anything on fire, so it looks like we are going to last to the end of the lecture. <laughs> Famous last words, now somebody will set fire to something outside. Uh, we're going to look at some reactions where we can change the speed of them and get some colour changes. Let's just move the wash bottle out of the way so you can get a good look at this. And so the first one I'm going to do is in my little uh, container here, and I'm going to do um, what's called the BZ reaction. I'm on a roll because I've pronounced this right about the last 20 lectures, so let's see if I can still get it right. Belyazov Zabatinsky. Yes, there we go. But everyone calls it BZ because that's easier to say. So, what this reaction is, is it's quite uh, complicated. It's a reaction that's what we're going to call oscillate. Now, when you do a normal chemical reaction, like we've seen several this evening already, we add some react, we mix some reactants together, a reaction takes place, we get um, a product. And then the reaction's over. So these beakers, they're those colours. They're not going to change again unless we add some more chemicals to cause another reaction. These bottles, the colour bottles, will not change unless we shake them or do something to make them change. This catalyst reaction is over. It's not going to revert back to what we started with. Uh, we can't turn the whoosh bottle stuff back to oxygen and ethanol. Most chemical reactions are not reversible. They're finished. This is a reaction that's going to oscillate between two different colours. That means flip between one and the other. The chemistry is quite complicated. It was spotted by these two Russian chemists, obviously called Belizov and Zabotinsky, in the 1950s. And we still don't entirely know how it works now, sort of 70 years on. Um, so the chemistry is quite complicated. We're not going to explain it in detail. But it is a reaction that oscillates. I'm going to get it going, because it does take a minute or two uh, to get going. It should get going a bit faster than normal, because normally when I do these demonstrations in the school, uh, I've travelled there a while, and so the stuff's been in the boot of my car, or even overnight as I've gone somewhere a long distance. And usually it's so cold, and the solution, that it takes ages to get going. So this obviously just come from my store covered over the other side of the university, so it uh, should work a bit quicker. So it's a reaction between malonic acid and potassium bromate. That's not particularly important. But the catalyst is manganese sulfate. Now, manganese, not to be confused with magnesium, manganese is a transition metal. Remember we said ma ma transition metals are brightly coloured? This isn't brightly coloured, but hopefully you can see it's a pale pink. Yeah, it's not colourless, it's not white. So, so it's a pale pink colour. And that's the catalyst. So if I put that in, hopefully, in a few seconds, we should see a reaction. I'm going to put my piece of white card behind it so you can see it a bit more clearly. Um, and the solution, you can see, has gone brown or orange or whatever you want to describe it as. That's because the reaction's making bromine. Bromine, uh, the element in aqueous solution in water, is Brown. So I didn't want to show that one. I wanted to show. I put the wrong slide on. Apologies. Uh, ignore all this guff down here. It's correct, but it's quite complicated. Basically, what's happening? This is the reaction at the top here, and the reaction is producing bromine, which is orange. But what happens is, when you get a certain amount of bromine, another reaction will start. This blue arrow to react it away to make bromide. And bromide is colourless. So this colour will gradually fade to colourless over a few minutes. It will take a little while to get going. So I'm going to explain how it works while you keep glancing at that, because if we just sit and look at that, it's not very exciting. And it will take two or three minutes before the first colour change happens. But I don't want to start it early. So if I started early, you'd all just watch that whirring around and not pay any attention to anything else. So there we are. So we've made the bromine. That's where we are now. It's gradually going to fade to colourless bromide. And then remarkably, once we've made lots of bromide and the bromine's gone, it's colourless, that will then start going backwards and make the bromine again. And it will become orange again. Then it will fade to colourless, then it will go back orange, then it will fade to colourless, and it will keep doing that for about 20 minutes. So we're not going to be here that long, we've only got, I've only got a few minutes left. And I've only got one more demo to do after this. Because notice I'm working my way across from my left to your right, or the other, my, sorry, your left to my, oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so to give you an analogy of how this works, this is a model. Remember, most things we use in science, students often forget this, and think that sort of things are real, and they start making things anthropomorphic and saying, um, you know, fluorine loves electrons and sodium hates electrons. Well, no, these are, these are atoms, they're not alive. Um, they're not animals, but we often make them anthropomorphic. We have to try to avoid doing that. 
Um, but this is a, we often use models to explain how things work. We can't see individual atoms, they're too small, or individual molecules. So this is a model given to me by one of my, uh, one of my colleagues. Um, he used to use this in the summer school. I see that colour's fading. It'll go almost colourless, then it'll very rapidly go back orange, then it gradually goes colourless, and very rapidly goes back orange. So it's a model to explain, to think about predator-prey relationships, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this, from biology. So the example we're going to use is, there's an ice cream field. If you've got an ice cream field, that attracts a bunny. Of course, bunnies like eating grass. And the bunnies, we are going to assume the bunnies are the bromides. They're colourless, okay? They're not, well, granted, there'll be no bunnies, doesn't it? So they're colourless. But of course, when you attract an animal to the field, you'll attract its predator. You'll attract a fox. And the fox, it handily for us, is red. That's representing the bromine. So the bunnies are the bromide, they're colourless. The fox is representing the bro bromine. So what happens, of course, is bunnies do what bunnies do. They've got a nice green field of grass, so the bunnies reproduce rather rapidly. You'll get a very a colourless solution. You've got loads of bunnies, not many foxes. That's what it's heading towards now. Okay? But of course, as the bunny population goes up, that's more food for the foxes. So the fox population goes up. And as the fox population goes up, the bunny population goes down because the foxes are, are scoffing them all, basically. Or they run away. And so you get to a point, which is what we started with, where there's lots of orange foxes and no, very few bunnies. So the solution's orange. We've probably gone back to that now. But of course, once all the bunnies die off, there aren't enough bunnies to sustain the foxes. So the fox population declines because they haven't got enough food. And because of that, of course, the rabbit population goes back up because they haven't got a predator. And so that cycles round. So we're at that point now. Lots of bunnies, it's very pale, not many foxes. This doesn't oscillate at the same rate. It takes a long time to decolorize, and the color comes back. It's doing it, there we are, straight back again. Um, what is good, it's working now. So keep half an eye on it, we've nearly finished. Um, so it'll take a minute or two to gradually lose its color. But then it very rapidly, within a few seconds, gets the colour back. So it's not doing it at an equal rate. But that's a nice little model, an analogy, to explain how it's working by thinking about predator-prey uh, relationships. So the real chemistry of how it works is a lot, more, a lot more complicated. And very handily, that's brought us to the finale, which usually means it's the end. And so I have one final little colourful chemistry uh, demonstration to show you. So I'll, uh, let's get this right. Let's put the lights off first. Okay, so, there's enough light there to what's going on. So I'm going to watch this circle. I'm going to carry out a chemical reaction this feature on my old-fashioned overhead projector. And it has to work on an overhead projector. These new swanky visualizers, like we've got on the other side, don't work. I have to project the light through the beaker for this to work. This is a demonstration I was telling you where we're going to make some particles in the solution big enough to reflect light. Because I said that doesn't happen. Remember we said that a long time ago at the start of the lecture? In the green beakers... Uh, solutions don't reflect light, the particles aren't big enough. This is going to make the solution big enough, the particles big enough to reflect light. So if you watch the circle, and uh, notice what colours it goes through as the reaction proceeds. Shake. Now I've got some musical accompaniment for you. If we get this to work properly. Yay, there we go. So just watch the circle and enjoy the music. Notice what colours it goes through. It started white. Notice what colours it passes through. faster than usual. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, that's done. Thank you very much. Let's put the uh, lights back on. Oops. There we go. Right, so, what you're observing on the screen is we're going to have to apologise. Remember last week I didn't have any hydrogen? I normally explode hydrogen balloons with this, but I still haven't got any hydrogen. So, uh, I thought, oh, well, I was going to blow up the helium balloons, but I'm not being a bit boring. So, I didn't bother. So, what colours did it go through? It started white. What's the first colour you saw? Yeah. Yellow. Then? Orange. Orange. Then? Brown. Brown or red, yeah. And then it's completely gone blacked out, hasn't it? Black. So, where do you see that happening? Um, out in the environment on a daily basis. White, yellow, um, orange, red, black. <coughs> yes, um, something specific in the sky. Possibly. Yes, I'm, I think of something that happens in the, in, the, in the sky most days, unless it's cloudy, you can't see it. Yeah, sunset, it's a chemical sunset. Whoops. There we go. So that's the chemistry. Uh, it's a chemical sunset. So the reaction is sodium thiosulfate, sulfate, that stuff reacted with, that was what was in the beaker. I had a little bit of hydrochloric acid to set it off, and you get various products. The important one highlighted in yellow there is what we call colloidal sulfur. Solid particles of sulfur, which of course is an element. Oh, there's thought a proper element link at the end here, I never realised that. There we are. <laughs> that was just serendipitous. Um, but those are particles of solid sulfur, and they get big enough that they can actually reflect light because they're bigger <laughs> particles of solid, they're bigger than nanometer uh, size. And as the particles get bigger, they reflect uh, or refract light at increasing wavelength, so you get first all the whites passing through, there's nothing there, then you'll get yellow, orange, red, and then eventually it's now so dense, the, the particles of sulfur, it's reflecting all the light straight back down, nothing is passing through. See, can't see my hand there really. But take the beaker away, you see, light's coming straight through. But these colloidal sulfur particles, you can see it's got cloudy, are large enough to, uh, to completely block out the light now. But as they were growing, they refract, refracted different frequencies. And that's a chemical, that's a chemical sunset. A colloid, by the way. Colloids are very common, but no one ever recognises the word colloid. We use colloids all the time. Aerosol sprays, colloid. Um, emulsion paints are colloid. Um, salad cream and mayonnaise, I talked about earlier there, colloids. There's hundreds of colloids. But foam is a colloid. A mist and fog colloids. They're very, very common things that we uh, encounter every day. We just don't know they're called colloids. There used to be a nice topic at GCSE that everybody used to do in the 1980s uh, sort of and 90s where everyone used to learn about colloids and take it off the spec. Which is silly because it's something we all, we all use aerosol sprays, don't we? And, uh, and we drive through the fog and we use salad cream and mayonnaise and stuff. So that's what a colloid is. One type of particle suspended in another. Okay, there we are. So I've got lots of people to thank for this workshop. Oh, that says workshop, so it's lecture. Uh, I was reading the word workshop down there, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, so I'm really particularly for inviting me to do the Holmes Lectures this year. Uh, my colleague Anna is now retired from Northumbria, who co-wrote this with me for the International Year of Light four years ago. Um, various colleagues here at the department who either provided some of the slides or suggested the demonstrations to me, and some of our technical guys who helped make some of the uh, bits of equipment that, uh, that I've, uh, I've used here today. And especially up to yourselves for uh, for turning up this evening. So there we are, there's a quick path through uh, elements of chemistry. Thank you all for coming and thank you all for listening.